So these are my aloe vera in the kitchen garden and we have different types of aloe vera. Uh, this is one type and uh, uh, as you can see it's not something that grows very tall but we have another aloe vera that goes very tall and it is more than my height and it is very tall and then we have another type of aloe vera that is just a single one the one that is being shown so with barbara we are going to learn more about the uses of aloe vera it is something that you need to have at home this plant is a must-have plant you have to plant it either in a container or if you have a small piece of land you can just plant it it is going to save a life and it is going to be helpful to you this is the um, aloe barbadense, mm -hmm. which is probably the one that has the highest medicinal, medicinal properties. And this is your indigenous uh, aloe. And I think if you had nothing else, you certainly could, could use that one. But what I was going to first um, show you is a few things you can do with the aloe. And if you don't mind staying there, yeah. I'd like to use your arm. Mm -hmm as a demonstration. Yes. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a nice size leaf and I'm going to demo today what I've been talking about, how you can cut the leaf and then sit it in a, in a jar like this, it can be a glass or a jar, and all the yellow that is lining the skin it drains out in an hour. So we're going to leave that there and we're going to get back to that. But I've asked um, uh, Gladys to stay here because I, I'd like to show you what to do if someone has a bad burn. And the best thing to do if someone has a burn is you cut a leaf and then you cut it down the middle. Um, it's a good idea to cut the... Thorns. The, th the, th the thorns off because if someone's just had a burn they don't want anything like a thorn going anywhere near them and we had a lady uh, a friend of hers rang me and said this lady has been badly burnt um, boiling water had gone on her arm she's been to the doctor and the doctor says she has to go down to the big hospital in Sydney, which is a six hour drive away, and possibly have um, a skin graft, and she may not have the use of her elbow again because right in the centre the burn was at its worst. She also had some burn on her chest that the water had splashed up and over her. This lady had little twin boys who were only two at the time. Her husband was really pressuring her to go to Sydney because they feared that she'd lose the full strength of her arm. And then her friend told her that I might be able to help her. And so I met with her the next day and when I saw her arm, the, um, the inside, a lot of the skin was basically falling off and this was the area that her doctor had told her would have to have a skin graft. So I'm going to show you what we did and we had a few helpers. The berm was over the arm but it was most seriously there. So I cut the aloe as I've just shown you and we just placed this, see that beautiful slime? And we just placed it and I wanted to show you how we placed it. Can you see we did a small bit down? So we did it like a jigsaw. So the small bit there and up, and the small bit there and up. And so the whole, but I'm going to take it off for a minute and you can see that beautiful covering that it gives. But what we found is if you, if you take the skin off and just use the gel and bandage it up, it starts to dry it on the edges. And then when you go to take it off, it can tear the skin. But if you keep the skin of the aloe on the aloe, it will never dry out. And so we had a few people and we got everyone to hold it because as you can see, it's very, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very slippery. And so we got a few people to, to hold it. Um, Gladys's skin is going to be very beautiful here now. Yeah. 
and, um, and we had big long ones that took up the whole arm and we bandaged it on. That was not easy because it's so slimy but we, that quite a few people had gathered to, to see what, what we would do. And as soon as I saw it, I said, it is not as bad as I thought it would be. And we put a couple of strips on her chest. And she'd already done that from what I had previously told her, but they wanted me to have a look at it and assess whether I agreed with the doctor or whether I thought we could do it. And I said, I believe we can do this just with the aloe. And the husband was a little concerned, but I said to him, I have seen worse burns than this respond. The aloe has a growth stimulant, it's called a lantern. And that growth stimulant stimulates rapid healing in the skin. So we wrapped it on. I'm going to just take this off now for, but you can see how lovely and slimy it is. And if you were to just rub it in and leave that, in fact, we might even do that if you don't mind, Gladys. Yeah, we will leave it there. <laughs> and, th and this is not for a burn. For the burn, you must have the skin on it. But you will find that that will dry and make a skin, mm -hmm. if you don't mind to let that, to yes. let that sit. Mm -hmm. I, I said to the lady, don't move it for 24 hours. So every 24 hours, put some new strips of aloe on it. And I didn't hear again. Sometimes I don't hear again. I think no news is usually good news. And it must have been a year later, I'd, uh, I went into a shop in a nearby, nearby town and the door opened and a man and a lady came out. And when they came out, they looked at me and their faces just beamed and they said, Barbara. Look at her arm. And I looked at her arm, I could not see a mark. She said, look, I have full use of my arm. It had totally healed. Mm. So many underestimate, underestimate the value of this aloe plant. Now where I cut it, we're looking at the time, I'd like us to have a look at that by the end of our presentation. And you will find that a skin is already growing over it. And that's because of the growth stimulant in the, in the aloe vera. Okay, that's drying out already. Mm -hmm. And beautiful for the face, ladies. And my son, grandson, Sonny, has got very white skin and he burns very, very easily. And a couple of times we've had hats and shirts on him but back of his neck got burnt or his arms get mm. badly burnt. And we just do this. We just rub the aloe over it. And I usually r rub it over it after his shower, about an hour before he goes to bed. And by the time he goes to bed, see that's dried already in there. And this bright red skin, by the next day, all the redness is taken, taken out of it. So for burns, mm -hmm. and of course, if it's severe burn, like the skin coming off, then you keep the, the skin on. But for some burn, it's usually enough just to, to, to wipe it over. Uh, for eczema and psoriasis, it can be, can be very healing too. So for any skin problems. And when this yellow has drained out, and it's already starting to drain out, so we'll have a break, and in the break, those that are here can come and have a look. And after an hour, we will cut the bottom off, slice it up and put it into this jug of water. And you can drink it. And the benefit of that is you get that aloe vera with its growth stimulant lining the gastrointestinal tract. Very nice for a sore throat, will ease a sore throat will ease the whole passage of the gastrointestinal tract. So it can be used for stomach ulcers, for irritable bowel, for Crohn's disease, any irritation in the gut. But if you didn't get the yellow slime out of it, it can be irritating and even cause diarrhea, which we don't want when someone's got a gut problem. So every home should have one of these. It's, it's, and what we found too, when there's been a bad burn, it takes the pain out. So the pain, and I've seen this in serious cases, the pain might be 10 out of 10, which 
a burn will cause and the aloe vera is placed on and that can be a little tender and then you, you wrap it on and the person usually tells me that within about 10 minutes they're down to 8, 7 out of 10 and sometimes it can take an hour to get down to about 5, 4 out of 10 and 5 and 4 out of 10 pain the person usually can sleep with that reduction mm -hmm. in pain. So we might move over to hormones now. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to begin by going through some of the symptoms of a hormonal imbalance. So some of the symptoms of a hormonal imbalance in a woman is when they're nine or ten. That's that's far too young. It's almost robbing a young girl of her of her childhood. More symptoms can be fibroids, can be cysts on the ovaries, can be endometriosis, depression, thyroid problems, very painful breasts, very tender breasts, uh, premenstrual tension, getting irritable just before the periods come. So they are some of the symptoms of a hormonal imbalance in a female. What about a male? Hormonal imbalance in a male can manifest itself in low sperm count, uh, penile dysfunction, inability to hold an erection, also prostate problems. And too much of the female hormone can cause a man to be effeminate, and too much of the male hormone in a female can cause the female to be masculine. And we see a lot of these symptoms happening in people today. And Sometimes, and I find myself, people think that's just them and they have to live with it, but not so. God has given us a body with an inbuilt ability to heal itself. So what I'd like to do in this presentation is I'd like, you, I'd like to show you how the hormones are, are made. And then I'm going to show you the monthly cycle, how these hormones work together. And then we're going to have a look at what throws the cycle out because remember Proverbs 26 verse 2 states that the curse causeless shall not come. So we're going to look at what throws it out because something has thrown it out. And then I'm going to finish by showing you how you can bring back the balance. Because remember we live in a body that has the ability to do that when it's given the right conditions. So notice what our sex hormones are made from, cholesterol. And in a previous presentation, we had a look at how cholesterol is a very important lipid in the body. Cholesterol protects the cell against damage, especially the nerve cell. Cholesterol also is necessary to make vitamin D. And cholesterol is the basic building blocks for our hormones. If someone's on cholesterol lowering medication, they can begin to manifest a hormonal imbalance because they haven't got enough cholesterol to be able to make the hormones. From cholesterol, the body makes pregnenolone. And from pregnenolone, the body makes progesterone. As you will see as we go through this, progesterone is a key hormone because from progesterone, estrogen's made, often called the female hormone. From progesterone, testosterone is made, called the male hormone. And from progesterone, the adrenal hormones are made. They're your fight and your flight uh, hormones. I'm going to show you how the monthly cycle works using the hormones. And it's a 28-day cycle. So I'm I'm going to use some coloured pens to show you how this happens. Progesterone is going to be the blue one. Progesterone's nickname in the body is happy hormone. So I've got a HH here, happy hormone. And I was talking to a man recently and he said, you know, I have learnt in my marriage, happy wife is a happy life. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are some homes that are a little unhappy because the wife is not happy because she has a hormonal imbalance, meaning she's lacking proper levels of progesterone. The other hormone in the monthly cycle is oestrogen. 
and estrogen's going to be the red one. And estrogen's role in the body is that of a cell proliferator. Cell proliferator basically means causes massive cell growth. It is estrogen that causes the skinny young girl to develop into a beautiful shapely woman. So estrogen isn't bad, it's only when it's out of balance. But if these estrogen levels remain high after the young girl has developed, then, then the, the lady can get out of shape. I liken estrogen to fire and water, a good slave, but a bad master. So let me show you how these two main hormones work in the monthly cycle. Day one of the monthly cycle is the day that a woman begins to menstruate. And day one of the monthly cycle, progesterone levels are low. Day one of the monthly cycle, estrogen levels are also low. But by day seven, <coughs> excuse me, they're starting to rise. And by day 14, Oestrogen is the main player in the monthly cycle. So what effect does oestrogen have when it's high like this? As a cell proliferator, it causes massive cell growth in the lining of the uterus, again building the blood nest. Oestrogen also has an effect in the ovaries to cause eggs to fully develop. Oestrogen also causes a form of lubricant to be released in the birth canal. When a fully developed egg bursts forth from the ovaries, it's picked up in the fallopian tubes and starts to travel up the fallopian tubes. Let me show you. So here is the edge, we're going to just look at the edge of the uterus and the blood nest has been developed in the first, in this first uh, section of the monthly cycle. And out of the uterus on either side, so I'm just drawing one half, is the fallopian tube. Here are the ovaries, and the ovaries are connected by a, a ligament. And so what happens is, Around day 14, a fully developed egg bursts forth from the ovaries. And then the ovaries, once they've released the egg, this egg is picked up by the fallopian tubes and it starts to, to work its way up. Now you see the hole where the egg bursts forth, it develops a blister. And that blister is called the corpus luteum. This little blister is very important because corpus luteum is the main site of progesterone production in a woman's body. Can you see the importance of a woman ovulating every month? Because when she ovulates every month and the egg's released, corpus luteum develops. And when corpus corpus luteum is developed every month, it maintains progesterone levels which maintains all the other hormones. And so, with the development of corpus luteum, by day 11, now we've got a rise in progesterone. Progesterone now is the main player in this monthly cycle. No need for oestrogen, we have our blood nest, we have our lubricant, we have our egg, and so the message is given to oestrogen, you can stand back now. We don't need you anymore. Our red is getting very faint here, so I might use a black. So now oestrogen basically stands back. It's played its part. So what effect does progesterone have now that it is the number one hormone at this time of the month? Well, progesterone, as the happy hormone, heightens a woman's mood at this time of the month to the point of in 
increasing her sexual desire at this time of the month. Oestrogen also finishes, puts the finishing touches on the lining of the uterus, on the blood nest. But it also has another effect and that is on the cervix. Now the cervix is, is like a little cushion that sits between the birth canal and the uterus. Now usually, so we'll look at it from top down, it looks like a little cushion with a button in the middle. But sideways, it looks like this. And usually it has a, a little mucus plug there. But at this time of the month, with the rise in progesterone, there are changes. And the changes are that the sides come up a little tighter and then a special form of lubricant is released around the cervix. And that lubricant is designed to facilitate the entry of sperm up into the uterus. So you can see the stage is set for the entry of man. It is estimated between two and 500 million sperm are released with one ejaculation. And sometimes up to half of that sperm can come back out again. So we're left with maybe half the sperm and it's got a long journey, long way to go. And some of the sperm go down the wrong fallopian tube, but some of them go down the right one and aha, they've found their prize. And the prize, of course, is the egg. I was at a conference once and I saw it has to nudge its way into one of those folds. Very occasionally, two sperm can enter at the split, same split second and that's when the twins share the placenta. But once that sperm gets in, all the other folds shut tight and a chemical is released to kill off any other sperm that might try and gain entry. Isn't it incredible what science is now showing us about the inside workings of the human body? And isn't it a miracle that any of us are here when you consider everything that has to be in place for the conception of a, a new human being? I'd like to talk to you for a moment about sperm. When sperm enters a woman's body, it is an alien, so her immune system rises to attack. But when sperm goes through the prostate gland of a man, it takes on an immune suppressant property. And so when woman's immune system rises to attack the sperm, the immune suppressant property of sperm knocks back her immune system and sperm survives. But woman's body has memory and every time her husband enters her, her immune system rises to attack and then it sees something familiar. It says, ah, its husband will stand back. But can you imagine how damaging it can be in a woman that has multiple partners? And can you imagine how damaging it can be in the area of anal sex, which is what God never designed to happen? What happens if there is no conception? What happens if the sperm and the egg do not unite? Then by day 26, progesterone levels drop. By day 26, oestrogen levels drop right down as well. And when both of those levels drop, the blood supply to the uterus is cut. And when the blood supply to the uterus is cut, the blood nest comes away. And we are once again at day one of the monthly cycle. That's what it should look like. But unfortunately today, it does not look like that in many women. Why? We must always ask why because there is always a reason. And Proverbs 26 verse 2 states that the curse causeless shall not come. Why? why? Why is there a disruption? Something has come in. So let's make a list of what could cause an imbalance. It was 1957 when the first contraceptive pill was introduced to women. 1960s is called the sexual revolution. Women wanted to be able to have sex without falling pregnant. 
But unfortunately, men and women have, are, and are continuing to pay a very high price for this so-called sexual freedom. What is the pill and how does it work? The pharmaceutical companies grow acres and acres of Mexican wild yam. Mexican wild yam contains a plant chemical called diostenin. And in a laboratory, diostenin can be converted into progesterone. It's called progesterone because it is an identical molecular structure to the progesterone that is made in woman's body. Now the pharmaceutical company can't patent that. They can only patent something they create or something new. So they add a few more atoms in one area and come up with a synthetic estrogen. And that's what the pill used to be. But there were so many women who were getting major health problems from the pill that was just estrogen I think it was about late 80, like the late 80s, they had to put progesterone in as well to try and protect women somewhat. And so they added a few more atoms in another area and came up with this synthetic progesterone. These are the two synthetic hormones that are in the pill. And when those synthetic hormones are taken into a woman's body, they cause a disruption. And the body says, what's happening? Must be pregnant. And so the egg is not released and the woman doesn't fall pregnant. But if the egg is not released, then corpus luteum's not made. So week after week, after month after month, after year after year, so this is estrogen. Remember, the, the balance should be progesterone then estrogen, but month after month, with no corpus luteum made, Where's progesterone going? It's dropping. Month after month with the synthetic estrogen, where's estrogen going? It's rising. Good slave, bad master is now the master. Estrogen with its cell proliferator action is causing massive cell growth in the woman. In her uterus, there's the fibroids. In her ovaries, there's the cysts on the, on the ovaries. This is the breast lumps, these are the cysts in the breast, this is breast cancer. A wandering of this uh, lining of the uterus is called endometrium. Too much estrogen causes too much endometrium. Now it wanders all through the abdominal wall. And then every month when the levels drop and the woman's uterus bloodness comes away, all those little pockets bleed, but they have nowhere to go. And so when a woman has her periods, she's going through excruciating pain. That's endometriosis. 80 years ago, uh, it was hardly mentioned. Today, there's something like several million just in the United States alone. It comes hand in hand with the introduction of the pill. The pill has come in and caused a disruption. And I believe it's only really in the last 10 years that we're starting to see the devastating effects that the pill, the devastating effects that the pill has had on women. You see, men and women are paying a very high price for this so-called sexual freedom. Because if a woman's on the pill for five years before she has her baby, if she has a man or a woman child, both are born with hormonal imbalances because of the pill that she was on, which affected her genes, and that's affecting the next generation. So the baby boomers, so the people born in the 50s, 60s, late, late 50s into the 60s, probably 70s, they are the ones that were first introduced to the pill. So let's follow these women. Now they're in menopause age, how are they faring? We've got hot flushes, we've got women who are depressed because with the imbalance, we've not only got a rise in oestrogen with its cell proliferator effect, but we've also got a drop in progesterone. So this is causing a lot of women to be depressed also 
suffer from insomnia. High estrogen opposes thyroid problem. We have a lot of women who are on the pill in their teens and 20s and now they're in their 50s, 60s with thyroid problems. Obesity. You see, when estrogen's high, it's very difficult for a lady to, to lose weight. Let's have a look at the children of this woman. These are the, these are the women who are getting breast cancer in their 30s, 40s. These are the men who are having difficulty with holding an erection, low sperm count, even to prostate problems. All because of, the, of this disruption in the hormones from the pill. When I was a teenager in the early 70s, every girl I knew was on the pill. No, no one ever knew that there was any danger. And unfortunately today, young girls are getting patches sewn into their arms and that patch can sometimes last three years. And those girls aren't getting a period for three years. So for three years, corpus luteum's not being made. So our, the progesterone levels are dropping down. That's why anything that goes into our body, we need to investigate and find out what it is and what are the full effects. Even though Google, uh, YouTube has caused so much information to be made available, it's also caused a lot of confusion. So number one causing the hormonal balance is the contraceptive pill. But I meet women with major hormonal Im imbalances and they've never been on the pill. And their mother was never on the pill. There's more. What causes a chicken to be fully developed in five weeks? It's growth stimulants. It's against the law to give chickens growth stimulants now. So they've genetically modified the chickens to produce more estrogen. <laughs> And so whether it's because the chicken has been given growth stimulants or because they've been genetically modified to produce more, when the human being eats that chicken or eats the eggs from those chickens, they're going to be basically getting that estrogen into their body which can cause the imbalance. What about fish? Well, when you've got 80% of women on the pill or hormone replacement therapy, they go to the toilet, the sewage goes out to sea, the fish are feeding on the sewage, and then the people are eating the fish, so further imbalance. We're getting fish today that aren't, aren't able to reproduce. We're getting fish today that female fish having male tendencies, vice versa, it's never been seen before. So meat and its products. I believe we've come to a time on planet Earth where it is really unsafe to eat meat. And there's more. I've met women who've never been on the pill, they're vegetarians, and yet they have a hormonal imbalance. Plastics. Plastic is huge today. When I was a little girl, the cereal came in um, greaseproof paper in in cardboard boxes, the milk came in glass bottles. <laughs> when we went to school, our sandwiches were wrapped in greaseproof paper and put in paper bags, but everything's plastic today, so much plastic. There's also plastic clothes. There's a, there's a women's sportswear shop in Australia and if you go into that women's sportswear shop, it's got bras and tops and uh, long sleeve tops and leggings, all sorts of clothes that women wear when they're exercising. I went in one day, I could not find anything made out of natural fibre. Everything was made out of polyester or acrylic or nylon. These are the plastic fabrics. And when the lady gets hot from exercising and her skin opens, it absorbs the chemicals out of those fabrics. The good news is you can get such exercise clothes today that are made out of bamboo. It's called viscose. So please, ladies, start reading your labels. 
I don't mind if something is 80, 85% natural fibre and has a little bit of polyester or a little bit of elastine. It just gives, helps it to hold together, as long as it's predominantly made out of natural fibre. Also, um, hot food into plastic takeaway containers. Whenever the plastic's heated, it gives off more of the, they're called oestrogen mimickers. In the molecular structure of oestrogen, there's a phenyl ring. And these plastics contain bisphenol A and that's called BPA. You can get uh, plastic, I think this is a plastic, see the hard, oh no, that's glass. But you can get plastic that's hard and that's usually, usually it says it's BPA free. So whenever plastic has that phenyl ring in it, it's a, an oestrogen mimicker. And that's why plastics are contributing to this hormonal imbalance. Dr. Anna Zotto, she's a, a, um, an endocrinologist from, from the US. She was growing breast tissue in flasks in her laboratory. And whenever she injected oestrogen, the breast tissue, the cancerous breast tissue grew. She stopped putting oestrogen in, it stopped growing. She was using it as an experiment. One day, she came in in the morning to find out that this cancerous breast tissue had grown overnight. And she hadn't injected it with oestrogen. And as every good scientist does, they start to investigate why. So she rang up the people that make the plastic flasks that she was growing it in. She said, have you changed your flasks? They said, yes, we have a flask now and it's got um, bisphenol A in it. So the phenyl in the flasks was feeding the breast tissue, the cancerous breast tissue. So please be careful of your exposure to plastics. Also chemicals. So the chemicals that are particularly have an effect on the hormones is Roundup or glyphosate. I know in Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan president in 2015, he banned glyphosate because so many of the rice farmers were coming down with cancers, especially uh, of the endocrine system. I was very sad to discover recently that because of big, big pressure from the rice companies, they've reintroduced the glyphosate. That's very sad. So be careful of your exposure to chemicals. Go organic food as much as possible. Herbicides, insecticides. And also get the chemicals out of your home. The best cleaning products are sodium bicarbonate and white vinegar. You can even wash your clothes in sodium bicarbonate. And we, have, we talked about this a little bit when we were discussing cancer. Be careful of the chemical exposure your body has. And now we're looking at another aspect, and that is how they're, they're causing an imbalance in the hormones. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1, remember our, the best medical book we have is the Bible. The Bible says... Uh, uh, False balance is not good. <laughs> and we see this in the hormonal imbalance. It is not good. It's causing a whole area of health problems in people. And sometimes it's the missing link is this hormonal imbalance. And so now what I'd like to look at is how we can bring the balance back. Because God gave us a body with an inbuilt ability to heal itself. And when given the right conditions, the balance can be restored. So number one, how do we bring back the balance? If you don't turn the tap off, you're still going to be mopping up in the other corner. And so stop. And remember in our acronym, Sustain Me, the A is abstain. There are some things that you must keep out of your body if you're looking for optimum performance. So number one, we'll call abstain. Or you could say eliminate. I'm writing abstain because it doesn't take up as much room as eliminate. So what do you eliminate? The pill. 
There is a method that God gave us that we can have natural birth control. Sex is two-part, contraception should be two-part. The woman's part is to know when she is ovulating. How does she know? Her body will give her three signs. The first sign is that her temperature changes. And if she takes her temperature every morning and charts it, she will find that it'll go up and down a little bit. Then it'll drop and go up onto a higher plane. And this drop and up onto a higher plane happens around day 14, might be day 13, might be day 15, but it allows her to know when she's ovulating. My daughter Jessica showed me an app on her phone and she puts her temperature in every morning and the app on her phone tells her every day she's safe or she's not safe from the temperature going in. So the temperature is one sign, but there are other signs. And praise be to God that he gave us three signs to be sure. The second sign is that the, the vaginal mucus changes. So when a woman is not ovulating, which would be, she's usually ovulating in this third week. So in the second week and in the last week, she will find that her vaginal mucus is not as profuse. It's white, it's not stringy. But in the week she's ovulating, which is usually in that third week, it's the, the vaginal lubricant is more profuse, it's clear and it's stringy. So that's sign number two. Sign number three is that her cervix changes. As I showed you previously, the cervix is like a little cushion with a button in the middle and that button is the mucus plug. But when she is ovulating, the mucus plug goes and the, the edges come up a little tighter. So it's as simple as a lady testing her cervix every day. So if she tests her temperature every day, her mucus every day and her cervix every day and charts it. At first she's got nothing to compare it to, but as she does it every single day, as the months go by, she starts to see the changes. And she will find that those three signs usually come together in this week here. But again, if she monitors those signs in her body, it allows her to define it. So what's the man's role? The man's role is that when his wife says, I am not safe, which is usually this third week, then he either masters the art of withdrawal or he uses a condom for that week. My daughter Jessica and her husband Matthew were married for, oh, I think it was almost three years before their first baby was born. How nice for a couple to have a few years together before they start having little ones. In fact, they had three girls and they were able to choose each time exactly when they were going to have their, their three girls. In fact, the last girl, they held off a little bit because Matthew was building the house and they didn't want to have the baby until they were moved into the house. Well, the good news is the baby was born in their new house. <laughs> they had a midwife and a blow-up bath and the baby was born in their lounge room in the bath. It's very nice. So I call this God's method of birth control, that the body gives certain signs to know. So that's how you can abstain or eliminate using the chemical birth uh, control pills which are having a devastating effect not only on the lady that takes it but even to the next generation. The second point was meat and its products. Some of our guests that come to our health retreat want to eat meat and I say well if you want to eat meat and you want to keep healthy it must be organic or a very small part of the diet. I choose to eat plant foods and when people like meat I said I've got some news for you though which you might not like there'll be no meat served in heaven <laughs> because for someone to eat meat there has to be the, a death of an animal isn't that true and many children have become vegetarians when they realized that that sausage on their plate came from a little lamb or something like that. 
The third point that we are to abstain from is our chemical exposure and plastic exposure. So please be mindful of what your food stored in, be mindful of the clothes you're wearing, be mindful of the chemicals in your home and go as chemical free as possible. That's the first point in balancing the hormones. The second point is to restore the balance. Now how do we restore the balance? Well God is so good to give us herbs and there are herbs that can work with the body to balance the hormones. The, the wild yam contains diostinin and in that natural state it certainly can help to balance the hormones. In Australia you can buy a cream called the Anna's Wild Yam Cream and I have heard of people being able to order it online and be sent to Africa. You might even be able to buy a yam cream in Africa that's made in Africa, I'm not sure. But there are some herbs that can work with the body. The second herb in the Anna's Wild Yam Cream is chase tree. And the botanical name of chase tree is Vitex. And that can work with the body to help balance the hormones. Evening primrose oil. That can, is, can be quite readily bought, I believe. There's another herb called Dongkwai. I'll write it down so you've got the spelling. Dongkwai is a South American herb, but that also works with the body to, to balance the hormones. Remember Psalm 104 verse 14 where the Bible says that God gave man, sorry, God gave man herbs, yes. God gave herbs for the service of man. So the herbs come in and they work with the body systems. And we find many women are getting help through this. I have a friend who's a medical doctor in Fiji and she came and worked with us at Misty Mountain because she's a Christian and she believes that God created the body to heal itself. And she wanted to know what we did at our retreat. She worked with us for a few weeks and she's back in Fiji now and the Fijians call her the nutritional doctor. And she told me that she's helping a lot of the women in the interior, in the villages, balance their hormones. Why would their hormones be out of balance? Because unfortunately the pill has reached just about every, every corner of the globe by now, but also a lot of exposure to plastics and that's causing the imbalance. But she told me that she's getting them to drink green drinks. So she gets the island people to gather the wild greens, the edible greens, blend them with water, strain them and drink the, the green water. And she said that that is helping to balance the hormones. So what people can do in the city, if she has town people come to her, she gets them to buy green barley powder or barley green powders and she finds that those barley green powders, yes. She finds those barley green powders are also helping. I think we're going to have a break now, is that right? So we'll come back after a short break. send in your questions so we can engage and have them answered with our guest. Let me just uh, bring a few questions to our guest to answer. But brother, there's a question here. How do women with hormonal imbalance do natural birth control as their period dates change every month? This is where the month, this is where the signs show you. So even if the, even if the cycle changes from month to month, the three signs will come together. Mm -hmm. So the signs will help. Why is uh, there's another question? Why is there so much uh, such painful menstrual cramps after being 
on contraceptive pills for a long time? Because as I showed here, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the contraceptive pill causes a rise in estrogen. And when you've got a rise in estrogen, which is a cell proliferator, it causes too much growth in the endometrium, which can cause fibroids, which can cause endometriosis, and they're two of the main causes for heavy, painful periods. Mm -hmm. There's also another question. Can having the woman's fallopian tubes cut result in hormonal issues? If so, can one who has had her tubes cut be helped? Yes, if someone has had their tubes tied, they can be helped, and that's by implementing what we've looked at. Mm -hmm. And there are some more things we'll be looking at soon. Okay, great. What about pains or sensitivities around the ovary? Is that okay? I assume it's, you know, the corpus luteum, the blister busting maybe. Please help uh, confirm that. Sometimes women do get a little discomfort around that area, mm -hmm. but not always. If there is discomfort there, it could be an indication that there might be a cyst on the ovary. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's a good one. Then there's another question. How do you distinguish between good and poisonous aloe plants? Uh, well, what everyone does today is Google. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, can, you can identify, you can also get... Um, uh, you know, books that identify the different aloes. And actually there is an app that you can take a picture and it tells you the name of the plant. Yes. If it really picks the picture really well. So that's a good place to go. Does that mean that we could use the aloe vera, uh, we can use aloe vera and use it as a sunscreen? That's right. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be out in the sun for long periods of time, you'll, not even the aloe can protect you fully. So you need to you be in the sun in, moder in moderation, you know. Yep, or wear a shirt and a hat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another question um, about fistula. What are the causes of fistula and how can you manage it naturally without surgery? The causes of fistula can be many. Uh, sometimes it can be constipation, sometimes it can be sitting uh, for very long periods of time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be dehydration causing the constipation which puts pressure on the lower, on the lower bowel. Mm -hmm. So there can be a variety of ways and you can heal the fistula quite successfully by the sit baths. We looked at those last night which is sitting in hot water, sitting in cold water, um, alternating and also overnight the, the slab of aloe vera with the skin on it on the area can help to heal it. Also, it's important to make sure that the bowels are moving regularly so that constipation doesn't happen by implementing sustain me. Mm -hmm. Great. And maybe those who don't know what sustain me is, would you like to take us through that? It's sunshine and use of water. So making sure you're very well hydrated, that keeps the stool soft and also using the water in the hot and cold sits baths. And sleep, going to bed early. <laughs> early nights are vital for all healing. Trust in divine power, which takes into consideration um, ways to handle stress by trusting in God, knowing that he loves you. He knows your future and he has a plan for you and resting in his care. Abstain, it's important to stop all stimulants uh, it, because the stimulants dehydrate and when you dehydrate that adds to constipation and with a fistula constipation just compounds the whole problem by putting more pressure in the area. Inhale. Breathing in through the nose, low, slow and deep, stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system which helps to not only relax you, but breathing in through the nostrils puts more oxygen into your body and your oxygen is a healer. Mm -hmm. Nutrition, the plant-based diet. A plant-based diet, unrefined plant-based diet, helps to keep the colon regular by supplying all the fibre, the insoluble fibre. 
moderation, moderation in all the good things, and exercise. If someone has a fissula, they may need to do a form of exercise that doesn't put pressure on, on their lower bowel. The exercise bike might be good, the swimming and uh, rebounding. Mm -hmm. Great. And E for exercise rebounding. So a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Another question, how do you reverse endometriosis, uh, fibroids and cysts? By balancing the hormones because cysts, endometriosis and fibroids have all come about because of high estrogen. It's high estrogen that causes the growth in the reproductive area. Mm -hmm. And so balancing the hormones is vital. And also applying the castor oil compresses to the area, little by little by little, that can break up the cysts, the, endometri the endometriosis can be broken up, and also the fibroids. Mm -hmm. But the key is consistency, and it consistency. could take several months to speed up the process. You can do sitz paths every night as well. Mm -hmm. What causes blocked fallopian tubes? We have many questions. <laughs> okay, what causes blocked fallopian tubes? It can be a variety of things. Um, it's hard to absolutely pinpoint that, but most problems in the reproductive areas is due to hormonal imbalances. Mm -hmm. And um, other than the pill, how do other contraceptives affect hormonal imbalance? The, the uh, different types? Mo most of them have synthetic hormones in them. Mm -hmm. And it's since it, because even the marina does have some, thin, some synthetic hormones in them. So whatever device a person uses to stop uh, falling pregnant, it's interfered with the monthly mm -hmm. cycle. Mm -hmm. And that interference has uh, ongoing effects. Mm -hmm. Great. That's all we had from our audience here. Mm -hmm. Let me see if our other uh, team has more questions. At least not now. If any, I will ask at the end. Thank you. You can carry on. Mm -hmm. So we will continue with how we can bring a balance back. So we've looked at stopping anything that can disrupt the hormones. We looked at how you can use natural birth control. So you don't need to use the synthetic hormones to stop falling pregnant. Also the herbs the wild yam, the vitex, and which its common name is chase tree, and the dong kwai, and also the green drinks. So these are things that can be tried if you're unable to get the Anna's wild yam cream. And what brings ultimate balance into the body, in fact, where I first saw the eight laws of health written was in the Ministry of Healing, page 127. And after relating those laws, the author said, these are the true remedies. So no matter what happens in the body, to restore balance, implementing these basic laws. So number three is sustain me. As we just explained, Something that I omitted to say too as I was explaining the sustain me in relation to bringing about healing in the body is the, is the uh, sunshine. The sunshine, their rays go through the, ultra, um, the, the biochemical pathways into the brain, into the pituitary gland and that can help in itself to balance the hormones. So we should spend a little bit more time in the sun. I certainly agree that in the middle of a hot summer day, it's very difficult to be in the sun. You don't have to do that. So when it's a very hot weather, you can do early morning, late afternoon. But going to the abstaining, definitely the stimulants and the sugar. In his book, William Dufty showed how sugar having sugar every day influences the balancing of the hormones. And we had a lady attend our program and she had quite a, a major hormonal imbalance and she learnt all the things to do to her body to keep it in good working order and restore balance. So she emailed me. 
She said, Barbara, I went really, really well for six months. She said, I didn't have painful periods anymore. I wasn't as irritable just before my period time. But then it all started to creep back. So I said to her, have you, have you done anything that could have caused a disruption? And she said, well, I'm only having one cup of coffee a day <laughs> with one teaspoon of sugar. And just that one cup of coffee a day with the teaspoon of sugar in it was enough to, to once again bring those hormones out of balance. One lady said to me, I tried the Anna's Wild Yam Cream and it didn't work. And I said, how long did you try it for? She said, two months. So let me show you what's happening in two months. So here are our two hormones. Here is our progesterone and there's estrogen. And that's the level they should be in. But with a hormonal imbalance, it's called estrogen dominance progesterone deficiency. So after two months, we're about here. <laughs> And where should we be? The progesterone should be on top and then the estrogen. Now it may take 20 years to throw the hormones out of balance, but the good news is it won't take 20 years to get them back into balance. But it might take a year, maybe two, to get them into balance. So remember, whenever there's a problem, we always look at history, looking at the factors that could have come together to cause the situation. And then we look at the symptoms. And the symptoms really are the body knocking on the door saying, excuse me, can, can you help in this area? And then you try. You try poultices, you try hot and colds, you try different herbs, you try dietary changes, you implement sustain me. And when you get relief, that's the body saying, that's what I want you to do. See, the problem with drugs is they will take the symptoms away, but it's just covering them. They, they always come back because if you don't find the cause, if you don't eliminate what caused the problem in the first place, then you're not going to have a cure. So it's important to investigate and look at all the threads that come together for this. I was talking to a young girl that worked for us, she's 18 and she has a girlfriend who's 15 and she got the, the um, patch sewn into her arm for birth control. It all leaked out in two weeks and it was after 10 months she's still bleeding non-stop causing major imbalance in the body. I always say to women that come to our retreats in the US, I say, uh, have you ever been on the pill? And one lady said to me, no, I was not going to put any synthetic hormones into my body. How nice. <laughs> God made us to be the, the guardians of this body. And when this body's working well, uh, well, we're the winners. Isn't that true? But whenever it's thrown out, then we're the ones that suffer. And yet, it's so easy to try and blame external influence, isn't it? But you've probably heard the saying, we've got more to fear from within than without. Important to know what you're doing to your body and, and how it works and why it's doing what it is. So I'd like to show you and a lot of people um, can get a little bit confused, especially one man who didn't want to touch his wife when she had applied the yam cream because it thought, he thought it might make him effeminate. <laughs> so with a man, the number one hormone, as you can see, is progesterone. But with a man, the number two hormone is testosterone. The number three hormone is estrogen. Whereas with a woman, number one hormone once again is progesterone. Number two hormone is estrogen. Number three hormone is testosterone. So men and women have the same hormones, but they're just in, in different levels. 
And so if a man is exposed to, or maybe his mother was on the pill before she gave birth to him, so there's a bit of a disruption. Maybe he's had a lot of exposure to chemicals, a lot of exposure to plastics. So what happens, that gets the oestrogen up. Now, if the oestrogen comes right up here, then that man can, can be effeminate. And if the oestrogen basically um, has an effect to cause the testosterone to come up too high, that high testosterone causes inflammation of the prostate gland. So there can be all manner of imbalances. See, if a woman's testosterone comes up here, that's when she's, she has uh, masculine uh, tendencies. And if her oestrogen goes up too high, that's when she gets growths in the fib fibroids in the uterus, cysts on the ovaries. So, that, so there can be a whole lot of uh, scenarios. And you may have heard of this because it made headlines about five years ago that a very famous actress named Angelina Jolene had both her breasts removed because her mother died of uterine or ovarian cancer, I think, and she had a gene test and found that she had the gene towards um, breast cancer, uterine cancer, so she had her breasts taken off. But she didn't need to, because remember, genetics loads the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. And a lady told me this, I don't read the, the, the magazines that come out, but apparently a whole lot of women followed suit. So that there is no need for such drastic measures. All we need to do is work with the healing powers of the body and, and bring the balance back, because as I have shown you, you work with the body and the balance certainly can be restored in the body. I had a lady, this was about five years ago, who attended our program and she told me that she had a lump in her breast, she had it tested and it tested positive for breast cancer. And so she felt to be totally safe, she had both her breasts taken off. Now at the time when they took both the breasts off, they cut, and she showed me the scar here, and they took out fat from her abdomen and built up two new breasts. Three years later, she got breast cancer in the new breasts. You see, if you don't turn the tap off, if you don't eliminate the cause, um, you are not going to get a cure. And some ladies have had their breasts taken off only to find out that the cancer manifests itself in the ovaries, in the uterus. So what are we going to do now? Cut out the ovaries and cut out the, the uterus. When are we going to stop cutting? It, it defies reason. It makes no sense. Far better to find out the cause. And the cause of the hormonal imbalance, as you can see, can be, can be varied and can restore the balance. We had one man attend our program who had prostate cancer. And it's important when a man has prostate cancer that not only implementing the things we talked about on Monday, but also taking steps to balance his hormones. Because that high testosterone can cause inflammation of the prostate gland. So he'd, he'd gone on the medical route to help conquer his prostate cancer. He was having a hormone injection every three months to try and get his testosterone levels down. He developed breasts, he was getting hot flushes. And so he made a decision. He made a decision to implement Sustain Me. And with the Sustain Me, I'll just quickly summarise what he did. So with Sustain Me, he, uh, he started to be outside in the sunshine a bit more. He started to drink more water. He started to go to bed a little earlier. He, 
decided to trust in God. He was a Seventh-day Adventist, but he hadn't really taken God at his word before now. He decided to stop his daily coffee. He decided to stop his nightly red wine. He decided to go on a plant-based diet. So he eliminated the stimulants. He started to understand the importance of breathing through his nose, even to the point of putting that little tape on his mouth at night. His wife was so excited because he stopped snoring. So you don't snore through your nose, you snore through your mouth. <laughs> he went on a plant-based diet. He did all the good things in moderation. He began an exercise program and he applied the Anna's Wild Yam Cream. His wife emailed me 10 months later. She said, the breasts have gone down, the flushes have stopped because he also made a decision not to have that three monthly injection anymore. Remember, God's government is a government based on freedom and freedom is based on free choice. I, I am the one that chooses what, what I do to my body. And his wife said, the breasts have gone down, the hot flushes have stopped, and his testosterone levels are the best they've been for years. So he was getting remarkable results, not just by applying the Anna's Yam Cream, but by also doing the lifestyle changes. They're simple and yet incredibly powerful. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Bible says, Know you not that ye are the temple of the Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And it says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Many people don't realise that some of the things they're putting on their body or in their body are defiling their body. That's why knowledge is power. But I'd like you to go over to a few chapters further, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, where the writer says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You are not your own. We actually have no right to harm this body. We, we are accountable. <laughs> we are accountable to God for what we do with our bodies. And so that, that puts an even deeper meaning on the whole uh, issue of the health of the body. I'd like to now have a look.